And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Moose Lodge Games. Which I have, I have my own stories about about encounters with moose, but that's a whole other thing. And cre and creator of the of the upcoming campaign setting for Low Fantasy Gaming, the Golden Age of Cars. I'm hoping I got that pronounced right. A psychedelic sword and sandal game. The one and only Sam Renau. How you doing today, man? Or tonight? I'm good. How are you? Yeah. How are you doing? I am good. Some of my colleagues were panicking because they saw the first hints of snowfall, even if it was just a few snowflakes here and there. Shit, how far north are you? Are you? I'm in Minnesota, which is why I found their, oh, okay. which is why yeah. I found their panicking <laughs> um, hilarious. Bunch of friggin' amateurs, if you ask me. I mean, it's it's Minnesota. There are only four seasons around here. Winter, approaching winter, still winter, and road construction. Yeah. I'm in New England, so we get hit with snow for maybe like th four or five weeks really hard, and then it's pretty uh, clear the rest of the year. My sympathy is dealing with Boston. <laughs> and just any and just anybody who and just anybody who unironically um, calls himself a mass hole. Yeah, I don't think I'd, I have never heard anyone like willingly call themselves that, except for like touristy people. I'm pretty. Sh I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure there's some who there's some who act who <laughs> some on the sports end of things who who would who would say that. Um, yeah, there, there's no one classier than Boston sports fans. <laughs> 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 I can say that I've lived here my whole life. <laughs> Um, I suppose it depends on the sport, but, um, I certainly, I will only, I will only say that, I was going to say that about Bruins fans, but no, but no, no, there's shit in their yard too. <laughs> I'm just biased towards hockey because it's the one sport where no, where, where um no where nobody's gonna nobody tries to rush to break up a fight. Yeah. <laughs> Any other sport a fight breaks out, everybody's trying to break it up. In hockey, everybody backs up to let them get it out of their system and then punish them. Yeah, you gotta keep up the honor. That's how it works in that game. Well that that and trying to break up the if you try and break up the fight, you you're just gonna have them still still riled up and possibly di and possibly deal with worse. That's how you yeah. get the <laughs> insanity of the malice at the palace, or those baseball <laughs> fights where the whole where the whole bench comes out. Yeah. <laughs> and some people are some people are appalled by the violence, but I'm like, this is a contact sport and it ain't ballet, so. <laughs> They yeah. knew what they, they all knew what they were signing up for. <laughs> but I like to open with the humble beginnings in the temple. So I'd like you to walk me through your origin story when it comes to role playing games and what made it stick. All right. Um let's see. I grew up in the 90s and like growing up you'd always get like an occasional like pop culture reference to Dungeons and Dragons and I didn't I didn't quite understand what that was. I just knew I saw some game with like cool miniature figures and graph paper and funny dice and it was like fascinating to me. Like Especially, like, right now I have as my avatar on Discord. I have, like, Dexter from Dexter's Lab being the dungeon master from, like, the D&D &D episode of Dexter's Lab. So, anyway, the first time I ended up, like, really getting into RPGs, I had just entered middle school. And I was at Walden Books, a chain that no longer exists anymore. And I saw the player's handbook for a D&D third edition. And I was like, you know, I'm going to spend some of my hard-earned middle school money on this player's handbook and i ended up buying it got hooked uh 
DM'd a couple games when I was in middle school, but didn't seriously start getting into RPGs until I ran like a consistent third edition campaign in my senior year of high school. And I just started playing RPGs ever since then. Um, at first, it was mostly D&D third edition, and then I moved into Pathfinder. And I DM'd a game like that for years. And then I just got so burnt out on the amount of content that is required for 3rd edition Pathfinder that I ended up taking a really long break from RPGs. And then over the course of the pandemic, uh, the bug hit me and I was like, I'm going to get back into this. But then I like, was like, I know, I know there's other RPG systems out there because like I said before, before that, all I had really ever played was 3rd edition Pathfinder, a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of D&D 5th edition. So I was like, I'm going to explore some other systems. I found out about all the indie RPG scene, and I especially found out about the OSR scene, which I especially liked because it was like that idealized sword and sorcery fantasy that I always really, really wanted from Dungeons & Dragons, but never quite got it from 3rd edition and Pathfinder. So I was very happy when I ended up finding that. And um, yeah, about a year ago... I ended up saying to myself, I'm like, you know what, screw it, I'm going to I'm gonna write a book because I've wanted to write an RPG book forever. So I just sat down and I finally spilled my guts onto, the, onto a Word document and here we are 300 pages later. And fortunately you did so figuratively and not literally. I think that would have been a bit of a mess. <laughs> but... When you meant when you say sword and sorcery, that's interesting because a lot of the pe a lot of people that I've had on the in the temple who grew up with some sort of sword and sorcery thing, a lot of them aren't '90s kids. Um, if I had to if if I had to take a stab in the dark as to what was a early, what was a early introduction to you for sword and sorcery, um. Part, a part of me wants to say Hercules. <laughs> um. uh, you know, I grew up watching all those, like, um, 90s pulpy shows like Xena and Hercules because, like, my aunt would babysit me a lot when I was a kid and she always had them on, so... <laughs> um, I mean, may maybe Conan the Adventurer, if you're, luck if you're lucky, but that yeah. was a... Uh, that, was to that was totally not trying to AP man at all. <laughs> at... All, <laughs> um, but there, but, and may, and maybe, and pro probably in the years later, you probably caught wind of the Schwarzenegger Conan movies. Yeah, one good, one good one, and and two bad ones. <laughs> uh, because Red so because Schwarzenegger got top billing in Red Sonia, so I technically have to count that, even though um. I'm not sure how truthful the story is that went to that Schwarzenegger tells that he would that um to get his kids to behave he would say if you don't if you don't if you don't start acting right I'm get I'm gonna make you all watch Red Sonia. <laughs> I don't know that sounds that sounds like abuse. <laughs> <laughs> but. That's the reason why I, fi why I find it interesting that you me that um you mentioned that interest in, s in sword and sorcery, and I'm I'm guessing that as time went on, you ended up going back and looking at the pillars of it. Yeah, I ended up um you know reading like some Howard stuff, Conan. Um, there was like a series. I like I'm like the kind of guy that like when I read, I tell people all the time like I do not like good literature. I want to read like really exciting stuff that's like completely fantasy. So like I'm always at like the thrift store, Goodwill Savers, looking at like the two dollar fantasy books. I'm like, oh, here's some trashy '80s fantasy novel. I'm gonna read this tonight. So even when I was younger, I remember like at the library, I would see a book. I was like, oh, this this guy has a sword on it. I'm gonna read this one. Mm -hmm. Oh. Let me let me go let me do a bit of a um a bit of word association. I'll give you a name that's sword and sorcery or sword and sorcery adjacent and you you tell me if you're familiar with it or if you had de you had ever delved into that work. Um and some of the, some of these obviously will lean into the pulp end more in, more than the sword and sorcery, but I'll start with the big one, John Carter. Yep. Um Fritz Lieber. 
Fritz Lieber. Oh, no, I don't think so, but that I definitely feel like I've read the name before. That's what that is. Def, that's definitely it is one of the big names that was one of the inspirations for a lot of folk. Um, Elric. Yep. Oh. Um, as far now, as far as as far as the pulp end of things, the shadow. Yes. Uh, and lastly, the phantom. The phantom, yep, sweet purple jumpsuit over, uh, tra body suit over there. Yep. Apparently, is really popular in New Zealand. Don't ask me why. Really? <laughs> um, I said, I know I said the last one, but I lied. Um, Doc Savage. Doc Savage, yep. Uh, and Prince Valiant. It's not exactly sword and sorcery, but it's in that era. Yeah, I know. I know that uh, Prince Valiant. I I used to when I was growing out my hair when I was young. Uh, I remember like my mother telling me I had like Prince Valiant hair while I was in that awkward in between stage. It's certainly certainly fair. The the thing is, um, unless you were doing, and I'm pretty sure there were plenty of fantasy exploitation stuff that you had gone through. Um, some of it, some of it, as far as um, as far as film went, and. Some of it all right, some of it really bad, some of it is just weird, looking at you, Conquest. Uh, which is, the best way for me to describe Conquest is what, is what happens when a guy, who's known f a guy who's known in Italy for his gore films decides to make a sword and sorcery film. It is also, like, lots of, like, blood spurting and stuff like that? No. But I'm not. But I'm convinced he was on drugs. <laughs> now, the golden age of Kares, and I'm again. I'm hoping I got it pronounced right. Yeah, you got it, Kares. Yep. Is described as a psychedelic sword and sandal RPG. Um, just for the now, I'm I'm no stranger to the concept of sword and sandal, but just for the sake of the audience. I'd like you to go into what exactly is meant by sword and sandal compared to um, sword and sorcery or more contemporary forms of fantasy. So when I think of sword and sandal, I think about things that are set in like a vaguely eastern Mediterranean area. And that could range anywhere from like antiquity in the Bronze Age, like ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, stuff like that, to like the classical era, like Greece, Rome. Um, then you could also have like some those old biblical epics and stuff like that. So any kind of like fantasy based thing that's taking place either in like a historical Eastern Mediterranean world or like a fantasy world kind of based on those sort of tropes. Um, usually you think of sword and sandal because, you know, you're out in the desert, people are wearing sandals, they got swords and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I usually think of a lot of, um, a lot of adventure, a lot of, like, muscle-bound strong guys bending bars, a lot of, um, you know, nefarious sorcerers casting dark magic, things like that. And... Uh, and of course, with the psychedelic end of things, well, there's there's plenty of that in, in old pulp stories, and e and even the early day, even the early days of um, of pro of prog rock has a, has a lot of that, or so, or or just some just some doom metal end of end of things like say the sword. Yeah, a uh, big. Uh, I listened to Electric Wizard a lot while writing this. <laughs> that was that was going to be my second guess. <laughs> Um, of course, even beyond even beyond that, there's the with it there's the there's the particular weirdness that that happened with that happened with Iron Butterflies one hit. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I got that uh, album downstairs in my collection. So, <laughs> and I'm pretty I'm pretty sure you know the story about why it's called Inagata da Vida. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. I'm not entirely sure why somebody would be awake uh, awake for 24 hours straight on cheap wine, but <laughs> it was the 60s. It was a different time. <laughs> uh, plus, 
people do interesting things to give themselves ideas for projects. <laughs> oh. C case in point, Archimedes. <laughs> Getting the idea to fi to fix the to um to the solution to his problem by st by putting his foot in a bath. Yeah. <laughs> and then becoming the first streaker. Uh. <laughs> or at least the first streaker in Greece. Yeah, we go. But how did you? But since since you had dipped into the OSR of of all the OSR systems, what made you go with? Um, low fantasy gaming as your template. Um, looking at low fantasy gaming, I think it's like a really good way to kind of like uh, people who might have only ever played like fifth edition, fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. I think it's like a really good like stepping stone into like a full OSR game because I feel like low fantasy gaming is very much like an OSR adjacent game. It has a lot of um, elements from fifth edition in it. Like it has a lot more. It has a bit more customization of your characters than like a typical retro clone would do. Um, I really like the community of people who uh, were there, uh, who uh, worked on the game and uh, the Discord server. Um, and also, I really like uh, some of the like the really quick combat. Like they have like these things called major and minor exploits, which is basically like I roll dice to see if I do something cool, you know. So like a minor exploit might be things like I'm gonna shoulder check this guy, or then I'm gonna like trip him over, and they're like really simple and easy to use. It really speeds up combat, so it doesn't turn into like a ten minute slugfest. Um, I also really liked. The idea that magic it was supposed to be something dark and dangerous that you're not supposed to mess with. So there's like all kinds of like things to like prevent you that if you are gonna overuse magic, it's gonna end up biting you in the behind down the line because like every time you use magic, the risk that something bad happens to you becomes progressively higher. So I really like that mechanic as well. Yeah. Now. When it now when it comes to when it comes to this particular setting, you from what I understand from what I understand of it, you're going for more Bronze Age. Was was going Bronze Age meant in part meant to tribute the um, sword and sorcery that inspired you in part to um, set yourself apart? Um, I've always really liked the Bronze Age. Like when I was a kid, I wanted to grow up to be an archaeologist. So that was always kind of an era that I liked. I like the idea that the Bronze Age is kind of like mysterious. Like there was obviously all these great societies, but how much do we really know about them? Not much. Like take, for example, Khufu, the guy who built the Great Pyramid. We really don't know all that much about this guy, despite him building this giant monument that's been standing around for 3,000 years. So I've always liked that kind of like mysterious element to it. So that was a big reason why I chose the Bronze Age, because I kind of wanted to invoke those feelings of mystery and stuff like that. And now, we, now um, while, it is, uh, while it is built on the, on the framework of low fantasy gaming, um, what, how, how, um, would there be any mechanics with, within Golden Age that would be a bit of a step, a bit of a step apart from, um, from low fantasy gaming because of the fact that you're dealing with a specific setting instead of the, um, omni, the, um, the, um, pastiche fantasy or omni fantasy that low fantasy gaming is going for? Yeah, so like one of the things that I did was um, I ended up doing this mechanic called the Astral Breach mechanic in Astral Dungeons, and that's just an additional like uh, risk factor when you use magic that every time you use magic, you roll a D percentile, and if it is lower than your current Astral Breach score, then a Astral Dungeon opens up, which is basically like you get thrown into a pocket dimension that's like three, it's like two to three, four rooms. It's not very big, but it's all completely randomly generated. I described it in the book, like essentially like you're in the galaxy print universe now. It's like you're in the inside of a lava lamp, basically, when you're in there. And you, the characters basically, the PCs have to fight the, their way out of this Astral Dungeon and it's completely randomly generated. And I have a really quick generator, but like, roll these dice really quick. Here's what's in the dungeon. And 
there's also when you're in there a really cool factor that I like is that when you're in there there's always a chance that um one of your items could end up gaining a magical property if you manage to escape it there's a random chance that that could happen so if so if you do manage to survive this astral dungeon your rewards could be pretty good because you could end up be like oh i got this sweet magic item now for making my way out of this so it's kind of like a little reward you get for making your way through this um and another some other mechanics that i did was i tried to make the world feel like as kind of like alien and different as possible so like a lot of those common like things that you'd expect from like a f- typical fantasy game like using horses and stuff like that i don't have horses in the game like the main mount are camels and they do have chariots as well but they're drawn by zebra for example um and some other things that i did is i did a lot of like really like streamlining of some of the some like really old rules like i have a streamlined dungeon crawling procedure i have a streamlined uh, overworld travel procedure i have a streamlined encumbrance um procedure that goes there that i that me and the group that i play tested with think that they both they all thought that it worked very well mm-hmm. now Given given the whole astral dungeon thing and the and the way you describe it is almost almost like a dimension unto itself, would so, would someone be able to use that to to create a to create a dungeon without having to map out a full dungeon? Yes, because I basically said that the room I basically the rooms in the astral dungeon are always like very sim- simple. I said there's no traps in there. It's basically like when you're in there. There's like you roll, I think, uh, one d four, and that's how many rooms there are on the dungeon. And then it's basically like here's one room, here's two, three, four, and they're supposed to. And I wrote them specifically that they're all supposed to be very simple. It's basically supposed to be almost like a gauntlet to get through. Mm-hmm. And with and with that in mind, given the given the fact that you're dealing that you're dealing with a with a whole new setting. Um, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that the, that, um, just trying, just trying to retitle a lot of the, ba- a lot of the classes in LFG wasn't going to work. Because obviously, yeah, so I ended up, you have the drone and you've got some, and you've got some others. Yeah, I ended up, uh, doing, uh, six new character classes and I kept, um, and I kept four of like the classic like fantasy classes like bard, fighter, barbarian, rogue. I kept those four, and then all the other classes in the book are all unique to the uh, setting. Mm-hmm. So let's let's go in let's go into some of those if you don't if you don't mind. And I'd like to start with the boxer. Nice. I'm gonna open up my book right now so I can take a peek at it too. Let's see. Boxer, you are here. All right, I got him open. So, I'd like to, I'd like you to go into it and what the um, play style is for the for the boxer compared to say a monk, because a lot of people have the attitude of just reflavor a monk to be a bu- to be a pugilist. I'm not a fan of <laughs> so, not a fan um, of that kind of reskinning, but you can do it. <laughs> Yeah, so what I ended up doing with the boxer is he doesn't have... The boxers, they don't have any, like, magic key powers or anything like that. Like, you're not going to have, like, some Dragon Ball Z stuff going on. Um, So what I ended up doing with the boxer is I wrote them as almost like a glass cannon pest kind of character. Like, a class, they can kind of, like, move in really quick, then move out. And they can hit pretty hard, but they can't take a lot of damage themselves because... They need to fight unarmored. They can't use any weapons. Um, I ended up giving them uh, boxing maneuvers as their thing. So they're like special things, they, special techniques they can use while fighting. Like there's things like counterattack. Um, there's like bob and weave. There's things like a, a stunning jab, which is like a cl- I can't have like the monk-ish class not have that stunning jab. It's so classic. I feel like you can't take it away. Um and then the other thing that they have that I know that like D&D style monks don't have is that they have uh, boxing styles. 
that I ended up writing in there. So um, basically, uh, the boxers can take a different style, and they're kind of like passive effects that they can use. Like there's one that instead of adding your strength to your strikes, it's like the implication is like, oh, instead you're like a very agile boxer, so you can add your dexterity in place of your strength. Or there's another one where they're like a ground fighter, so you're like really good when fighting in the ground. There's another one where you're like a grappler and you get special bonuses when you're trying to grapple someone. So I ended up doing that, trying to write them more like that, like that kind of like a pest agile kind of a character. So, next would be the drone. Yep. So, uh, the drones are kind of like the closest thing you get on in the book. So, the drones, they can, f they can wear medium armor. They have some... Uh, skills and martial weapons they're not as good as fighters or barbarians at them but they can hold their own um they also cast some magic abilities and yeah they can cast some magic abilities they have a couple of uh uh what was it over here and they have uh in low fantasy game and usually at seventh level they get like a pretty cool technique so their cool technique is basically once per adventure, they can, like, reflect a spell back at someone. It's called Prophetic Intervention. And would, you, would you say that they, f that they fill in a, a um, Gish motif? Yeah, almost. A slightly, I'd say slightly stronger than your typical Gish uh, kind of a niche. So they can, hold, they can hold, definitely hold their own in combat if need be. I can I can certainly dig that. Um, yeah. Now next would be next would be the Magus. Yep. So the Magus is basically like the sorcerer archetype of the game. And I for uh, flavor, they're written as they're like any of the any of the magic users that aren't associated with like the Church of Atara, which is kind of like the religion of the area. So they can be any they can be like anything that's not a part of the church. So they could be like some witch living on the edges of society. They could be like a weird old man who just so happens to know magic. They could be someone that worships the evil moon god. Yeah, so basically and they're just basically a sorcerer archetype. They are de physically the weakest class, but like in most classic OSR games, once they get to those higher levels, they can really dish out some uh, strong attacks and uh, sh some strong effects yep we are v we here in the temple are very familiar with linear and quadratic <laughs> but um speaking speaking of the church of atara um and make and let me know if i've mispronounced this the maklu yep the maklu the maklu are exorcists they um their uh, magic abilities, they can, for the most part, only affect supernatural beings, uh, the undead, jinn. There are these creatures created by dark sorcery in the campaign world called uh, Rabisu. That's another thing that can be affected on. But other than that, their uh, sorcery is mostly useless against like other humans or other mundane threats. So they kind of like they kind of like feel the niche of they're like they're the Ghostbusters of the of the world. <laughs> So if you are doing a campaign or doing a session where you're going to be running into a lot of those things, having a maklu around is very helpful. Which certainly makes sense. And the next would be the mobed. Yep. The mobed are uh, the priests of the Church of Atara that know sorcery. Um, they're much more of a support role. Um... So their magic, they can do a little bit of healing magic, and the rest of their stuff is either boosting attributes of people in the party or doing more passive effects, like there's an ability here that they have called Idol Eyes, where it's basically if there is an idol of their uh, patron deity, they can see through the eyes of that deity, of the, the statue or that idol. I can, yeah, I can, get, I can get behind that. Um... 
And next would be the next one I wanted to ask was on the Nomad. And I'm guessing the Nomad is not far removed from a Ranger, but not having the curse of the Ranger archetype. Yeah, the uh, Nomad I kind of wrote in as being like, they're like the wilderness rogue, if you would. They're the wilderness thief, so they're really suited for a wilderness travel. So they have like survival skills, they're the people that like, if you're gonna go out into the wilderness so you don't get lost, you want to take one of these guys with you because they get bonuses for that, to making sure you don't get lost or getting back on the trail or trying to find vantage points to look ahead. And I'm getting... Given that, I'm, ge I'm guessing that so that it would be relatively easy to do a hex crawl with this campaign setting. Yes, I have been running hex crawls exclusively during playtesting, almost. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, it's it's at the very least nice to see a character that's doing the outdoorsy motif that isn't cursed. Yeah. <laughs> I know a lot of people. I know a lot of people like to say that the rain that the rangers that the ranger sucks in fifth edition. But some people have this idea that the ranger only recently started sucking. This is not true. The ranger has been snake bit since D and D. Although it is kind of funny that I ha that I have among my among my third party collection for fifth edition, twenty two. Attempts to revive revise the ranger from various people. Oh jeez. <laughs> now some might say what some might say what's the point of having twenty two uh, twenty two? A lot of them were a lot of them were from package deals. Yeah. <laughs> but the but the point is, is that when when so many people are trying to fix the are trying to fix the ranger. And so many of those fixes end up taking out the casting. I think that's telling. Uh, but yeah. Next on the class exploration is the Penthu. Yep, the Penthu. So the Penthu are a physician class. Um, they have a lot of strange drugs and elixirs and poisons and stuff like that. They're like a non-magical healer. So in this kind of game and setting, a low fantasy game, uh, you can't always rely on magical healing. So the Penthu is the character that you want to rely on for healing. They can, uh, they give some bonuses to healing while you're resting, um, and then they have a whole bunch of different uh, drugs and elixirs that do various different non-magical effects, so you don't have to worry about screwing yourself over with magic. The trade-off with that, though, is because they don't invoke any of those uh, dark and deadly magic effects or astral breaches, that most of the Penthu's uh, um, abilities must be t must be given orally. So you have to manage to either sneak it into a um, to someone, or will have them willingly take it. Which I can, I can certainly get, I can certainly get behind that. Oh, yeah. I mean, we yeah, and play test and during. Play I was gonna say during play testing, uh, one of the uh, character, one of the PCs was playing a Penthu, and they ended up encountering some monster that they knew they had no chance of beating head on. So they ended up distracting it, getting it out of its lair, and then the character playing the Penthu went back in and drugged all of this monster's food, and then they just waited for it to be all drugged up before they went and attacked it. <laughs> well, you gotta have the pharmacist and the harmacist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and actually, because they are, they are also another physically weak uh, um, class... Uh, at level 7, this uh, class, they get an ability called Surgical Strike, and it's on a, cr on a critical hit. Not only do they do like the normal critical hit damage, but you also roll on an injuries table. So they end up getting an injury too, with the idea being like, because this is like a doctor who knows anatomy, and now if you're level 7, you've probably been in, been in the trenches for a bit, that you really know how to hit someone and hit them hard when you need to. <laughs> Now, with the, now with that in mind, the the other thing I the other thing I was curious about is with is um do you have plans on putting in any new races or do you intend on making this as human centric as you can do? 
I'm gonna do this very human centric. I've never been the biggest fan of like those classic fantasy races like elves and dwarves, halflings, half orcs, and all that stuff. So I've always, whenever I've played a PC, I've almost exclusively always done human. And when I run games, I usually make them very human centric as well. Which I'm perfectly fine with because. I'm re I've really gotten sick of the stereotype of the uh, of human fighter being Babby's first character. Yeah. <laughs> now, granted, some of that is because the because the way a lot of a lot of fantasy games design the fighter archetype is really bad, really <laughs> milk toast, and the whole oh you can equip any weapon doesn't re doesn't really um doesn't really have all that much impact. When you're when you're only going to be, cr um, you're only go you're only going to be using one particular weapon for most of your for most of your adventuring career. Yeah, and then like um the other thing is um uh, making this world human centric is like the idea is supposed to be like it's humans versus the unknown or humans versus the weird outside of the city states of Kares. I do appreciate that there that there's the addition of um of a unique feature list because um if there's one, if there's one thing that could that could go well or go horribly when it comes to the way low low fantasy gaming is designed it's the unique features which is kind of the game's answer to to having subclasses or yeah they're kind of like old feats <laughs> I would. I would say feats, although it has a better understanding of feats than the actual fifth edition. I've I've railed on the use of feats in fifth edition for for missing the point by making it an ASI alternative. Because <laughs> it's because what because because due t due to that. You're only gonna ha you're gonna have so few so few opportunities for feats, unless by some miracle you ended up rolling ridiculously high on on your ba on your base ability and got it at 18. So you, so yeah. and then get and then bring it up to 20. Yeah. So on low fantasy gaming, you get like that unique feature every third level. Now, and I gave some sample I gave some like sample ideas that you could use in the book. Some are things that some of my players have come up with, some are things that I came up with. Um so and then like even like low fantasy gaming and like their core rule book, they basically say for unique features, um they encourage you to look at other books and like see if you can get ideas from there. And obviously everything's at the GM's discretion. Yeah. Now I did notice in the material that you had sent me that you have the inclusion of of Jin <laughs> cuz yes. it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a fertile crescent story without Jin. Correct. <laughs> huh. And since since that's going to be something unique quote unquote to this setting, um I'd like you to I'd like you to tell me about the role that the role that Jin play within the within Karis. So, uh, Jin represent chaos. A lot of um, Bronze Age cultures, especially the ancient Egyptians, were very concerned about the idea of chaos. They viewed their world as being in order, and then they viewed anything outside those riverbanks in the desert as chaos. So, I kind of ended up making Jin like kind of like a personification of chaos. They're not bad. They're not good. They're more neutral. Sometimes they like to cause chaos in the name of good. Sometimes they like to cause chaos in the name of evil. Sometimes they like to just cause chaos because they feel like it. It's just they think it's fun. So um, what Jin do in this game, the uh, big mechanic that they have, is that there are some Jin called Noble Jin, and they are able to grant wishes, which are very powerful magical effects. But the big thing is it's not just like three wishes, whatever you want. It's uh, depending on the type of jinn. 
they can only grant a wishes that have to do with like their domain. There's some djinn uh, that can grant like those standard like three wishes, but for the most part, the kind of djinn that uh, you'll encounter are things like there's a djinn of the winds and they can grant wishes that have to do with the wind or air and stuff like that. There's the djinn of festivals. There's uh, the uh, djinn of the dead, djinn of the riches, and they can all grant wishes that have to do with their camp, with their uh, domain. Uh, the Jinn of the Wish of the Winds is, um, one thing that they can do is that they can just deliver a message to anyone you, you want them to, want it, uh, it to be delivered to, regardless of where they are, and their caveat being is because they like to cause chaos, is they will always deliver the message as the, at the most inconvenient time for the person. So, uh, I think during playtesting, uh, they ended up finding one of those, and they sent um, the djinn to deliver a message to this guy that they were uh, doing a mission for. And I ended up saying something like, oh, well, the djinn interrupted him while he was in the middle of the father-daughter dance with his daughter at her wedding or something like that. So the most inconvenient time the djinn could think of, that's when it did it. I'm guessing you plan on putting in suggestions for, um, for caveats when it comes to wishes that GM yes. can... You, can use and or abuse yeah i put in here something like um the gm may rule i gave some uh, examples of things that these jinn could grant and then i said the uh jinn could grant other things that have to do with their domain but it is up to the gm's discretion of how much they want to do mm. now, given given that um what would what would be some of the what would be some of the good the um, suggestions in general for what would what would be a wish that fits these gin and what would be a wish that might be pushing it? Uh, let's see. I'm gonna take a look at one of my gin and see if I can think of a good one. Um, I have the gin of the dead can grant immortality. Um, the caveat being is that. Um, they still age as normal, and they suffer suffer the debilitating effects of an advanced age, but they will not die of natural means. I think what would be pushing it is if you truly made them invincible and invulnerable, so, like, they literally could not die. What, in, one, what instantly came to mind for me is, and this might be a little bit obvious, but the Golden Touch. Yes, that could uh, <laughs> that could be pretty fun. Uh, I just realized that uh, there's a gin of the riches, so that would probably some be something that I would rule against. I might do a caveat like it would only last for like one d four touches or something like that. Being like the gin's like, hey, I can I can grant you this, but I'm not that powerful, man. <laughs> yeah. And what and um. I'm guess and I'm guessing I'm guessing that um when it comes to a lot of the wishes that they could grant a good amount of them would not be specific to um to to um actually give actually giving some brand new rules that would be a lot of um narrative leaning yeah and then um if there are mechanical things I usually list what they do there if I gave suggestions like um the djinn of um, riches can do something like the djinn conjures 1d4 plus 1 amphoras full of gems. Each amphora is worth 3,000 shekels. Which I can, I can certainly get behind that. Now, yeah. when it comes... Now, um, one, of the th one of the things that I saw that was the... that was a big... that was a big focus on the setting um, part of the part of the material is the Karezian Empire and I'm I'm guessing that this that the Karezian Empire would be somewhat analogous to Babylon. Yeah, they're basically like kind of like how I would imagine like a Bronze Age empire would work. So it's like a couple different city-states and they control like these river valleys immediately surrounding them, but you go anywhere further than that, it's the empire says they control it, but they don't really kind of a thing. <laughs> I'm guessing it's I'm guessing it's one of the 
since we're dealing with city states, I'm guessing that there's a that there's a bit of a divide between people who are within the city and people who are without. Yes. Um the areas in the city and immediately surrounding it, they have the full rights of the empire. The further you go out, my, your mileage may vary because once you go far enough out, it's like, can the Empire really enforce these rules? Probably not. So you're up to, like, there's, like, uh, a lot of, like, petty kingdoms and tribes, warlords and that sort of thing that control those areas in the wilderness. I wouldn't be surprised if some, if some of those areas are... are um left are left to their devices because even though they even though an army could go out there and curb stomp them um the cost isn't worth the benefit exactly or to put it another way it's a situation where starting a, starting a war that far that far out into the borderlands might be a good idea but seeing it through a little less so yes now, I know we, I know you, t you talked about running a lot of, um, a lot of hex crawls with this, but could someone run a more urban inside city state kind of campaign? Yes, they could. Um, actually, my first uh, couple sessions of playtesting was a lot of urban explanation uh, exploration. They ended, um, my PCs ended up getting involved with like a local gang, and they were like running jobs for them. They ended up getting themselves mixed up into a whole bunch of things in the city. Mm -hmm. And with that in mind, have you con have you considered putting in a um, event chart? To, ha to help move things along when it comes to a city-based session? Um, I do have one small table uh, in the back for urban encounters that are pretty much just like generic urban encounters that could happen. And then for I uh, outlined four different city-states in the book, and each one of those city-states has a table for like rumors and hooks you could use to try to get people to explore the city. Now, with the, now uh, with that in mind, I'm, given the ha given how you said you started writing this during the during the worst part of the lockdowns, um, when it came to te when it came to testing this, what were some of the takeaways that you had? Because, unless I'm mistaken, this is your first foray into writing a full on um, RPG book. Correct. Um. What was uh, one more time with the question? Yeah, because it was my first time, and I lost it for a second right before that. What would you say were some of the learning experiences you had in playtesting? Uh, in playtesting, uh, the drone was so overpowered my first playthrough, <laughs> and I was like, I ran like three or four sessions, and like the drone was like curb stomping everything I came across, and I was like, yeah, I kind of need to tone that back down a little bit. Um, and then on the other hand, the physician class was a little too weak and specialized, so I ended up tweaking that a little bit as well. And when, when you say it was overpowered, was it a case of, of just, 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 um, just complete, just completely tearing through every, everything you threw, everything you threw at it? Yeah, basically, like, uh, the guy, uh, the character, uh, the PC playing the drone, uh, he was, like, one-shotting, like, monsters left and right, and I was like, oh, snap, I'm like, yeah, definitely, you're way too OP, to the point where, like, the, like at the end of one session, when he, like, cleared out, like, like, two or three things, like, no problem, without even taking a hit, I was like, yeah, I think we might need to, uh, tone down your character a little bit, so I ended up immediately, uh, tweaking like one of his abilities like right after that session um yeah because i was curious if it was a, if when you mention it being overpowered there's different ways that some can be overpowered sometimes it could be something is way too tanky sometimes it could be something um is doing way too, is doing way too much damage sometimes it can be both so i wanted to see where it, where it was um Oh yeah, it was it was definitely uh, both. Uh, we, he was like rolling like he was like one shotting monsters, and it was like taking almost no damage. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Or, like, when he did take damage, he was, like, able to almost instantly cure it back, like, immediately after the fact. <laughs> but, with the... Now, the document that you had sent me was 282 pages. Do you think that with art, with art and layout, the full book might might um hit past 300, or do you think it's still going to stay under 300? I think it's going to um, move past 300 after all the artwork is in. Because I'm already thinking about like some things like... I know there's one illustration of one of the cities in there, and I plan on getting the other three, so that's already three pages. I definitely need to get the map of the world, which is not in there. That's going to take up an entire page, and I'm just... There's so many ideas I have for illustrations that I know it's going to probably end up being over 300 pages. Not a lot over 300, but I definitely think uh, it's going to pass that. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that in mind, do you have as far now? I now um the the Kickstarter at the time of this recording is about halfway th is about halfway to the goal with 17 days to go. Um, so in the, in lieu of jinxing. That's not technically wood, but it's close enough. What would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the PDF? Um, the PDF, I could give everyone the basic version today if I wanted to. It's just not going to have all the illustrations. All the content you need to run the game is there. So... I could release like a preemptive one like the day after it's funded just b with the caveat being hey this doesn't have all the illustrations but all the content is there for the basic version. For the complete basic version I'm really shooting for June and for the deluxe version which is going to if it gets fully funded that's what I'm going to go for which is going to have a lot of formatting overhauls and stuff like that. Um, I'm really shooting for a fall of next year uh, release date. I and I I can certainly get behind that, and I do I do wish the best of luck because I'm look because I don't want um I don't want RuneQuest to be the to be the definitive Bronze Age <laughs> um, TTRPG. Yeah. Um, plus, yeah. So I I know I know RuneQuest exists, mm -hmm. but I have not read anything from it because I didn't want to accidentally be influenced by it. <laughs> um. I don't think you have to worry too much about it because RuneQuest is weird. Its world is a cube. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put it that oh, way. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I, RuneQuest has some Bronze Age leanings, but it has a bunch of other leanings as well it, and is the product of an absolute madman. But <laughs> I just wanted to get that joke out of, out of my system, especially since I've, I've had a lot of discussion over the years on the issues with how people view fantasy and how limited it is. Like, a, lo a lot of people seem to have this idea that it needs to be that um, British Isles pastiche in order for it to count as fantasy. Oh, no way. Like, that, that was a big thing that I did here. I was like, I'm going with something that's very much non, like, Western European. And hell, I th I think part of the reason why um, why the why stuff like The Witcher and Game of Thrones ha have taken off the way that they have is because they aren't doing that. That's my that's my interpretation at the very least. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I like that. It's uh like cause that like kind of like generic go to fantasy setting. It's like. That's what people automatically go to, and it's nice to remember there's an entire world out there that needs to be explored. But with that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for, com thank you for coming on. I hope to have you back in the future. Um... Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here... Excellent, thank you. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. 
Uh, if I knew that, I'd grab a beer next time. <laughs> well, now you know. All right, thank you. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!